also presenting. I'm really looking forward to this talk. So uh, cool. make sure you ask them lots of questions. Thanks. All right. All right. Hey, uh, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for uh, showing up to our talk. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Thumbs up? Right on. Okay. Um, well, so this is uh, adversarial simulation testing. Um, it's uh, unconventional offensive breach techniques. So essentially, we're not going to be dropping O'Day or anything like that. We're basically going to talk through um, more offensive techniques that we run into. So uh, just to uh, really go into the agenda, um, we're going to start with uh, introductions. Everyone has the obligatory introductions. Uh, then we're going to go into a coffee break. We're going to go into an overview, and then we're going to have another coffee break. I know you guys had barbecue, so that's why I'm saying this. Uh, breach simulation, uh, why, what it is, uh, how does it compare to traditional testing, uh, case studies, and uh, again, another coffee break, uh, another coffee break. And then uh, really the whole deal is ask, you know, ask, you know, what, all the questions, uh, have fun with the talk. Uh, we want to uh, really hear experiences and things like that as well. So when we get towards the end and we're doing the Q&A, hopefully we have tons of time for Q&A, uh, we definitely want to kind of have an interactive conversation. So without further ado, uh, my name is Chris Patton. Um, I'm actually a director for uh, the Advanced Services Group at Fishnet. We uh, primarily focus on uh, adversarial testing. So you guys may have heard it as red teaming. Um, <clears throat> we'll get into that here in a minute. But essentially, uh, essentially do uh, blended assessments. So we leverage things like social engineering, uh, physical security, uh, basically a lot of lo uh, logical pen testing, those sorts of things. We blend all of these and we attack an organization, right? We don't attack individual things, assets, systems. We attack an organization. Um, my background, uh, I was in the military, uh, so I was, uh, I was Air Force. Um, I moved to telecommunications, been in the industry in uh, various capacities for 20 plus years. I've uh, been with Fishnet for four and a half years uh, and I've Primarily, we've just been doing uh, penetration testing, uh, et cetera. And now we have this group. Uh, and Dan and I have been kind of traveling around all over the place public for the last uh, last two years, uh, performing uh, uh, these offensive engagements like this. <coughs> Dan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Dan Coatman. I'm a principal consultant with Fishnet. Um, I work for the team that uh, that Chris here leads up. I've been with Fishnet for about four years. Um, been consulting for about eight. Uh, primarily focused on pen testing, but uh, you know we've gotten more into these kind of blended assessments. Uh, we're getting more demand for it, especially with some of the uh, you know the high-profile breaches that uh, that we're seeing more of recently. So that's kind of why we've we've developed a talk uh, I think today to, to kind of focus on some of that. So okay, okay. So uh, really objectives. Um, let's define an adversarial simulation, an AK breach assessment or breach simulation. Uh, and that is, we'll, we'll, kind of, we'll kind of distill all of this out here uh, momentarily, but that's, that's kind of what we want to do. We want to, we want to understand what uh, the departure is from existing offensive testing and transition that over to these, uh, these more involved breach assessments. Uh, contrast traditional penetration testing and breach simulation. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the pros and the cons, uh, essentially why you'd want to do it, why you wouldn't want to do it. Um, really uh, talk about organizational maturity. You probably heard about the uh, cap capability maturity model. Um, I'm not gonna go much into that, but it really does, um, it does feed into kind of the overall reasons why we would want to perform a breach assessment. Um, expected outcomes, these are the things that the organization can actually learn from. Uh, so uh, we definitely want, uh, we want to understand some of the items uh, that come out of a breach assessment um, that are a little bit out of the norm that we would uh, typically receive from uh, as feedback from from say for instance a penetration test or something to that, that effect, um, and then really the roles in a in a security problem or in a security uh, a program. Why we want to uh, introduce this sort of testing overall into an organization's security program. So let's talk about the penetration test. Organizations go through. Uh, they, they, have, they have a requirement to perform a penetration test. They have a requirement for a system, a host, a network. Um, they have a new product that they want to, that they want to pen test. So they're bringing a, a vendor. Um, and the problem with the penetration test is that you hear things like it should be comprehensive and it should target all the, all the things, you know, all the services, all the, all the, uh, the operating systems, um, applications that exist on it, that sort of thing. Uh, it should only leverage one attack vector. 
So maybe you get in uh, and that's the only thing you concentrate. What can you get after you, you make that initial, initial breach, once you make that uh, initial compromise? Uh, it should leverage one or all of the attack vectors. Maybe they're more concerned about identifying all of the services and then seeing if there's vulnerabilities associated with all those services and then attacking those to see if there's, you know, see where they can get, right? It's more of a kind of a comprehensive approach. Um, the other thing that we, uh, we get quite a bit is uh, leaving the shields up or down. So uh, IDS, IPS, uh, HIDs, HIPs, that sort of thing. Um, and depending on uh, compliance functions, um, so say for instance you've got like a PCI assessment, right? Um, one of the big things is, you know, to, to perform a PCI engagement, they want to bring the shields down and assess the underlying vulnerability so they get a true uh, understanding of the underlying risk, uh, risk exposure. Um, or if they leave them up, uh, then at that point, you're essentially testing the effectiveness of an IPS or a prevention, like a blocking system, uh, but you don't necessarily know uh, what the vulnerability exposure is or the risk exposure is in case those fall over, in case those, uh, those first line defenses fall over. Um, some want nothing more than domain admin, right? Uh, get in there, get domain admin, show me impact, that's it. And that's what they're, that's what they're concentrated on, uh, that's what the customer's concentrated on. Uh, and then others will say, we want it all, don't leave until you hack the Gibson, right? We want to, we want to own everything, right? Um, and so really what it comes down to is, depending on who you ask, they have a different definition of what a penetration test is, yeah. right? You know, some, uh, some people think strongly about leaving, um, you know, the shields up. You know, it's not a penetration test unless you're truly simulating what an attacker would have to, you know, how he would have to approach a network. Yep. So this all leads to a common problem. We have an identity crisis, right? Um, and so this guy knows how to be, uh, knows how to be kind of awkward. Um, so, uh, all right, with that, uh, we have to ask ourselves, have we evolved? Um, so as, <clears throat> as organizations uh, delivering the service and as customers receiving that service, uh, we feel that, we feel essentially that uh, with the services that we provide uh, and the services that, you know, whether this is penetration testing, uh, whether these are wireless engagements, basically adversarial uh, services, um, there is this perception that we're providing something that the client wants, and at the same time, the client is purchasing something that they think they need, right? Uh, but we still have these problems where uh, we're, we're, we're kind of breeding assumption, right? Uh, as, as a vendor, we're breeding assumption. Um, as a client, you know, or as a, as a customer, uh, they have these assumptions as well. Uh, we market the material, they want that material, vice versa, uh, but no one's not really listening to what's going on in the industry, right? Things that are driving the industry would be breaches. So um, we, have to, uh, we have to evolve, we never give up, right? So we need to create something. What are we gonna create? A breach simulation. This is what we want to, this is what we want to address. We want to address all of those use cases out there, all of those scenarios where We've got uh, various breaches going on in the industry, and we want to emulate those. Those are, it's you know advanced persistent threat to use that cliche that uh, you know uh, <laughs> buzzword buzzword uh, oh, bingo. solid bingo solid yeah exactly okay. buzzword bingo. Um, so let's uh, let's define breach simulation real quick, and that'll kind of set the stage on uh, what we're talking about. So a breach simulation focuses on the items or items that are designated as critical soft hard targets. A concept of chain composite attacks is used throughout the assessment. The CCA, or the chain composite attack, provides a chronology of attack progression from initial unauthorized entry to final compromise. The events are demonstrated in a CCA, so the critical points of compromise are identified while they provide relevance about how each lead to subsequent compromise. Okay, that's simply just a fancy way <coughs> of saying and, and we use this internally, uh, the chain composite attack. Uh, what we want to do in a breach assessment or a breach simulation is we want to identify that first initial point of entry. Uh, and when we identify that first initial point of entry, we want to build those associative relationships. So if that first vulnerability leads to something else, we want to build that associative re relationship all the way through the entire attack chain. And that's what we're going to demonstrate at the end, right? We don't necessarily care about the breadth approach um, where we're identifying all of the points of entry, we're only focused on the most critical aspects of the organization 
uh, getting to the things that actually make the organization money, intellectual property, um, whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, and we want to build out that chain composite attack. And, and the idea of the chain composite attack is interesting too because when you do a traditional pen test, and um, those of you who are in consulting or have to write up reports, you know, you have no context when you're, when you're writing up the report itself. So you may have an information disclosure flaw and you write it up based on what you think it's actually worth. However, when we perform the breach assessment and, and we're able to kind of chain together all, these, all this information, we may find a piece of information very early on in an assessment, whereas uh, you know, normally it would be a low severity type of thing. And it turns out to be critical that it's exposed because we're able to take that information coupled with something else that we found, marry the two together, and then it suddenly becomes a critical finding on our network. Right, so it's essentially based in context. So if you have a standalone system that's not connected, it might be highly vulnerable, but if it's not connected to the rest of the network or it's not, doesn't uh, expose uh, a lot of risk, then we're not gonna rate that. It's not necessarily a high severity. However, uh, if we have those, uh, you know, we have another system that uh, might have uh, a lower severity item, but it leads into, uh, you know, maybe a, a, an exposed, highly confidential or highly secured environment, then at that point that severity can increase, right? So this is a slide, um, this is a slide by H.D. Moore, H.D. Moore's Law. Um, this essentially says, uh, it demonstrates really kind of where, where the skill is, uh, where, where you want to focus, uh, really how different, uh, different organizations leverage their, I guess where they leverage their focus, right? Where they leverage their focus uh, on uh, so we're, we're, we're saying skills versus, versus threat actors, right? Okay, and this, this is when you have, say for instance, on the far left, you have your auditor assessor, right? That's uh, a low skill, um, and it's no offense to any auditors or assessors, but uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where we, we, we live in like a compliance, compliance world. Um, as we move towards uh, the right, we start uh, getting into penetration testing. You'll kind of start to see this, this yellow line uh, come down. Um, and, and that's fine because we're kind of siloed in a, in a particular area. We're siloed in, say for instance, a, a system, uh, a host, a particular network. And at that point, we're performing a penetration test, say, against those items. Um, so at that point, you know, we have, we, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're in a restricted kind of constraint. Um, however, if we move towards the right, then at that point, that's kind of where we live in a breach assessment. Um, we take uh, more of the organized crime syndicates, uh, more of the espionage, uh, so far right there, um, where we have to learn a lot of this information. We have to leverage a lot of the information that we learn. We have to assess a lot of the targets, but we still want to main maintain covert covert operative uh, throughout the entire, uh, the entire engagement. Um, to kind of help that out and to uh, visualize this, if we, have <clears throat> if we have an individual like a traditional assessment, uh, say for instance up in the upper left hand corner, we'll call that a logical assessment, right? Uh, that could be, again, that could be a wireless assessment, that could be a vulnerability assessment, that could be a penetration test. Within that, that's kind of a siloed context, right? you're going to perform an assessment uh, and you're going to exploit those vulnerabilities in a breadth, breadth approach um, and you're going to uh, not really have much concern for all of the rest of those, those areas, those circles, those physical assessments, those OSINT recon, the social, the social assessment, et cetera, right? These are all kind of performed uh, in their own perspective, their own isolated uh, silo. Now, when you get to the breach assessment, the breach assessment takes in uh, pretty much all facets of those different disciplines. So we have, we have bleed over from a logical assessment, from a physical assessment, from a social assessment, and from OSINT and recon. And I've broken them out like that because that's typically what we run into. For logical, we run into things like penetration testing. Uh, you know, we have system vulnerabilities. Um, we have network vulnerabilities. Uh, we have wireless vulnerabilities, et cetera. Uh, physical assessments, we have uh, vulnerabilities that are associated with dwellings. Maybe uh, security, uh, security folks aren't manned 24 hours. Maybe they have ineffective uh, entry points, egress points. Um, uh, maybe they have you know, um, ineffective badge provisioning systems. Uh, so we definitely leverage a lot of that information. And then social assessments is essentially the social engineering aspect. Maybe we need to make a telephone, uh, telephone pretexting calls uh, in order to, to gain access. Maybe we need to send in a spearfish. Um, 
you know, something to that effect in order to gain that initial entry point. And it's not just necessarily the, entry, the initial entry point, but that could happen throughout, uh, you know, the entire network chain, throughout the entire uh, composite chain attack. Um, now with the OSINT and recon, uh, you hear a lot of folks talking about um, really, you know, what, what that means. So OSINT, uh, reconnaissance, information gathering, uh, essentially we're going out to public domain. We're looking for all the things that we can leverage uh, to target an organization, whether that's technologies that have been exposed, uh, job resumes that are out there, um, anything that's in social media. We can build entire profiles based on a single person. I just did an engagement um, where I called into a financial organization. I built the entire profile uh, based on just this, this one guy's social media presence, right? And when, when I called in there, I placed a phone pretext call and I was able to compromise the account three different ways. So it's, it's like those sorts of things that you're able to build leverage, that's good information, but there's only that sliver in the middle that's usable, and that's your intel, that's your intelligence. That's actionable information, right? That's the stuff that we wanna, that we wanna leverage, the stuff that we actually wanna use in the breach simulation. That's what we're gonna end up leveraging to actually gain, gain access. Okay, so this, this kind of just puts us side by side the traditional pen test um, and uh, the breach simulation. Um, we don't necessarily have to run through all of these, but it, it just kind of highlights the differences in approach, uh, or the, the, the differences between the two. So as Chris mentioned, the approach um, on a traditional pen test is a breadth first approach, right? We're gonna be comprehensive in nature. We're gonna pretty much touch all, all uh, you know, in-scope systems, all the ports, you know, we're gonna test all the things basically. Whereas a, you know, a breach assessment is more targeted. We don't really care. We, we care about it's a depth first approach. We wanna see how deep we can get. We don't care about testing every single host on the network. We care about the one that's gonna get us access, right? And then beyond that, we care about the, the, the next step that's gonna get us further access. You know, we don't care about testing everything. Um, attack vectors, as Chris mentioned uh, in that last slide, you know, uh, a traditional test is really logical only, whereas a breach assessment is, uh, it kind of marries all of those together. Um, let's see, what other ones are probably worth measuring, or worth mentioning? Um, severity measurement. Yeah, the severity measurement, uh, traditional, um, we'll use something like CDSS, right, industry standard, um, whereas a breach actually uses demonstrated risk. So as I mentioned before, you know, talking about an information disclosure flaw, you know, without context, it may be low severity, maybe a 3.0 CDSS score, but when we uh, couple it with maybe, I don't know, a uh, physical security flaw, um, maybe the two of those um, combined create a high severity finding. Um, also worth mentioning, um, the, the tool sets we use um, are quite different. A traditional pen test is really just a, a laptop and a, a breach. We have a, you know, a number of, of tools um, beyond just that. And then one of the most important pieces, as we've kind of talked about already up to this point, is the context. Um, traditional pen test has no context, really. I mean, you're just testing. You don't, you, know, you don't know what's most important. You don't really care because you're doing a comprehensive type test, whereas uh, a breach assessment, the context does matter. Um, where you find that vulnerability does matter, uh, especially if you can use it to pivot uh, internally or couple it with uh, you know, another finding. So um, the tool set, is that the next oh, we'll, slide? Yeah, we'll go into it. Okay. Right um, the, other, the other really important aspect of it is evasiveness. Um, so with traditionals, uh, so traditional pen testing or traditional uh, techniques, you might run into those occasional smash and grab type situations, but for the most part, uh, the traditionals are uh, overt. Uh, in nature, right? Because you're more you're more concerned about uh, the overall vulnerable state of those those subjects or those those items that are subject to, to review. Uh, whereas in uh, breach assessments, we want to maintain uh, complete. You know, we want to remain anonymous. We want to maintain covert. Um, and then uh, the other really really important part when we are executing these things, and that's for anyone who's doing red teams or is thinking about doing red teams compartmentalizing the folks that know uh, in the organization. So you have to have uh, executive sponsorship. Uh, that's critical, otherwise the project's gonna go sideways, and when it goes sideways, it's gonna be a really nasty thing. Uh, but, uh, so you definitely wanna have executive sponsorship, but you don't want all of your executives to know. Uh, you probably need critical people, like maybe your uh, physical building, your physical maintenance. If you're on a campus environment, you definitely want those folks to know, uh, at least one person to know. Uh, points of es escalation. Uh, you need indemnification clauses, so essentially uh, your get out of jail free uh, letters, right? So it tells you what's in bounds, what's out of bounds, your backup contacts, who's gonna be performing the, uh, performing the engagement, et cetera. 
these are all kind of cover your ass sorts of uh, sorts of things. But uh, it's definitely lessons learned. So um, why would we do uh, the next slide? Really, why would we do a breach assessment? Um, because in uh, 2014, documented uh, 131 breaches. Uh, some of them we didn't necessarily hear about, uh, and then some of them are big, uh, obviously big targets, right? We've got uh, we've got Home Depot, uh, J.P. Morgan, eBay, uh, Michael Stores, um, and then you know through, throughout all of those, definitely lots of uh, intellectual property, lots of credit cards uh, disclosed, uh, things that can uh, things that can impact brand defamation. They, uh, you know, maybe there's not a monetary association around that, but you know if you if you try to quantify that, that's going to be, you know, brand defamation is definitely going to bleed into that. So you've got both qual you can qualify those things and you can quantify those things. It just depends on how you truly look at it. One of the biggest ones uh, was uh, obviously Target, right? Um, so there's uh, there's quite a few uh, uh, lessons learned with uh, with that. But uh, all right, enough of my ranting. Um, we're going to talk about some case studies. So this is kind of really where the meat of it is. Um, this is really kind of we, we've we've gone through. Um, Three separate scenarios. Um, uh, the first scenario is more associated with um, a financial organization. Uh, the second scenario is uh, associated with a medical uh, organization, and the third is with a large insurance. So these are all big Fortune, you know, Fortune 100, 500, whatever companies. Yeah. Um, and, and we put together case studies. We think they're kind of maybe the best uh, basis for for kind of studying the. Um, advantages of a breach assessment um, because we can kind of highlight a number of findings and you'll see some repeats between the three different scenarios we lay out but we can highlight some of the findings that you know your traditional pen test is definitely not going to find um, and we can also kind of highlight some of the points where you know if you're not chaining together vulnerabilities or if you don't think that um, processes you have in place are important well you know we can show you otherwise you know uh, it, these are the types of things that a breach assessment can highlight it's not just to be cute, but they make for really good stories. You'll see some, the stories are very interesting. Okay, so and this is it. Uh, before we actually get started, uh, to uh, set the context, uh, we're just kind of go, go through some, uh, some tools of the trade. Um, so these aren't necessarily standardized tools that you would typically see um, on normal pen, pen test or normal, normal engagements. Um, so with these, uh, we kind of, uh, yeah, so we've got locksmith, locksmithing uh, tools. Um, so we have like bump keys. Um, Bump we, keys. Yeah, bump keys. So, uh, so essentially, we have uh, you know lockpicks, bump keys, um, those sorts of things. And th those are basically just leverage to get past uh, you know physical access, right? We run into situations where we need to uh, bypass a door. Uh, this might be uh, an external perimeter door. It might be an internal perimeter, or it might be an internal door. So we need that to actually like gain gain uh, initial access in order to get a logical foothold in the organization. We want to place. Uh, say, for instance, a malicious device, right? So in that particular instance, we uh, use things like that. That's a cone plug, right? Um, yeah. And it's running a full version of a uh, full version of Linux with uh, Metasploit on it. Um, You've heard of the Pony Express, right? right. Yeah. And it okay. costs what? Four hundred bucks, five hundred bucks, yeah, something like that. Bucks, yeah. You can build your own. This costs one hundred fifty bucks, I think. Yeah. It's so cheap a plug, right? Yeah, it's cheap a plug, but yeah, it's sweet. So you just plug it into the network. Um, you know, it looks like a, a you know power device, whatever, plug it into power, plug it into a network jack, and it establishes a backdoor connection. So yep. we have it set up to establish a VPN connection back to our labs. Yep. Uh, cold boot software. So uh, uh, con boot is one of those, and that's, uh, that, you know, once we actually do gain access, and these are this is physical access to the systems, right? And we don't, really what we want to do is establish that initial foothold persistence, get out of the building. If you stay in the building too long, you're going to get caught, right? So we just want to get in, get out. Um, so with cold boot software, um, essentially we can, uh, and Comboot's a, a perfect example, we can actually boot into the BIOS, uh, boot Comboot, Comboot will actually rewrite or patch up the authentication process, and then at that point we can just log in local admin without a password, right? And that allows us to, uh, to drop, uh, drop shell, drop whatever we need to do to establish a, uh, establish a, a persistent connection. Um, the other thing that we typically do uh, is we, uh, we have RFID badge cloners, uh, emulators. Um, yeah, so this is just a kind of a cool uh, DIY uh, Kickstarter project, uh, R Fiddler, um, and that allows us to uh, actually uh, 
basically clone a, a vast majority of uh, proximity cards. So if we have, uh, if we find badges uh, on employees, or if we find badges that are laying around, something to that effect, then we can clone those badges, recreate them, and then come back at a later time to, uh, to actually be able to uh, gain access to the building. Um, we talked about rogue devices. Uh, the other thing that uh, we, we uh, kind of downsize, right, we, we try to carry as much power as we possibly can uh, without having a big form factor. So we just use like a little ne uh, Nexus 7s uh, that are running Kali NetHunter. Uh, allows us uh, a pretty much a full blown version of Linux. We can drop into shell. Uh, we can pretty much do anything uh, that we need to do. Uh, we have, uh, you know, micro USB connectors that allow us uh, Ethernet access, um, that sort of thing. That way we're not looking around MacBooks, we're not looking around a bunch of extra gear. Um, and then other things that uh, we end up doing, uh, phone spoofing, uh, we run asterisk uh, uh, PBXs so we can actually spoof and, and impersonate help desk. Uh, maybe we can impersonate uh, vendors, et cetera, that uh, might have a relationship with the organization that we're attacking. Uh, so this is this might lead to initial foothold uh, or it might lead to an additional foothold when we're, um, uh, once we're, we're actually within the, uh, within the organization, once we have a little bit of persistence. And then finally, and I think this is the most important uh, one of the most important parts is uh, just having, having you know, skills in general, but software development skills. Uh, if, if you hire a vendor uh, and they come in and they're like, okay, we're just gonna run Metasploit on you or, or something to that effect and try to get an outbound shell and you expect that to work and you're, you're, you know, you're pacified with that answer, that's fine. But in, you know, in our experience, uh, if you're able to code and able to develop your own C2 uh, uh, connections, you know, back to your command and control servers, uh, then you have a much better uh, you have a much better uh, probability of extracting and, and actually exfiltrating uh, data and all, all, you know, in addition to establishing persistent connectivity. Um, and one of the things that I didn't uh, include in the tools of the trade is that we've leveraged a lot of uh, cloud-based VPS services. So we, uh, for our C2 server uh, implementation, a lot of times when we're trying to send shells or send connections, once we've compromised an organization, we'll send the shells out to uh, these, these cloud-based organizations. Um, that way we can, one, stand up multiple C2 servers. In the case, in the event that actually one does get compromised, we can move them to a different region. So I, we, I think we pick on DigitalOcean a lot, right? Yeah. So, but digital they ocean. can block our IP, you know, yeah. like customers can block our IPs left and right and then just switch instances, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's a cat and mouse game. Yeah, yeah, so like that, that way, like if, you know, if we've got, uh, if we have an IP address on VPS that's in San Francisco, and they're like, okay, well, we blocked you, so we just bounce over to, say for instance, you know, Amsterdam or over to, over to Germany. They just turned up a, a new a hosting facility in Germany. So now like we can bounce all over the place. And the nice thing is that we can clone uh, we can clone our VPS image and just move it over. We just basically just transition it and bring it right back up and we're back in business. We just shovel our, our uh, uh, connection over to the new IP address and we're, we're good to go. And they have a nice API too, so eventually we're working on it, but eventually we should be able to do that probably from an app or something on our smartphone. Yep. So if we're physically on site and, and we have trouble getting back to our current instance, we can spin up another one you know, based on just client side calls that uh, you know, we have. Yep. So. Uh, and you forgot to mention also one oh. tool of the trade that has only been used once on an engagement is a grappling hook. But it's worth mentioning. <laughs> Even if we've only used it once, $25 at an army surplus, the best $25 I've ever spent. I got that call. That was, that was a great call. Yeah. It's like, hey, we need a grappling no hook. Joke. And I was like, what the hell do yeah. you need a grappling hook? It was for? a legitimate <laughs> attack vector, and it worked. Uh -huh. And so, yep. Okay, so the scenario, uh, we'll go on the scenario real quick. For the, for the grappling hook, was that uh, they didn't actually like secure the. the the, uh, the first floor uh, doors were locked, uh, but the second floor, they left the doors unlocked, right? And there was kind of like this balcony area. Grappling hook. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, and the, and the weird thing about it, so the second floor, yeah, I mean, they had like picnic tables and stuff. There was no way, no way up there from the outside of the building. But you could see the doors from, you know, the ground level, basically. And they actually had like a deadbolt lock, but it was on the outside. It was visible on the outside. Like, you know, why can you unlock it from the outside and there was no card reader or anything. So we could have just gotten a ladder, we could have rented a ladder, but the guy I was working with wanted to get a uh, VW Bug for a rental car. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we could like haul the ladder around on a VW Bug. <laughs> <laughs> Did you fire it with a crossbow? 
No. Oh, no. Like, I've never threw one. I was scared as hell. I was scared as hell throwing that thing up there. But I tell you what, the first throw, it was perfect. It was perfect. But I couldn't do it again. <laughs> So uh, this is honorable, honorable mention because I didn't feel like dealing with TSA. Um, they wouldn't know what that is, and I'm just like, yeah, whatever. So uh, I don't know. There is the um, who's the company that uh, that originally did this? Um, it's, uh, they changed their name. Yeah, Bishop Fox. There we go. Uh, so they originally built this. So uh, it's it's basically it's it's a hid hid badge reader, right? Uh, it's one of the big ones, uh, so the ones that are like out in parking lots or whatever. Uh, so Bishop Fox originally built this thing. Um, it allows it allows people to come by, you know, like unsuspecting victims to come by, swipe their proximity badge, uh, and then it reads the information off the proximity badge, so you can clone it at a later date, right? So you can either take the take the information, rebuild it, uh, replay it onto uh, another. Um, That's what that was Card. Yeah. So you can replay it onto one of these. Um, so this is a T55X7 uh, format, um, which is a universal format. The other format is Q5. Uh, Q5 is primarily found in uh, the UK, um, but they're kind of moving away from that. So this is pretty much uh, primary, primarily the format. Um, so this, uh, this HID reader, uh, you can basically just place it up against the wall, uh, maybe use rare earth magnets or something like that to place on a pole, uh, put it out there, and uh, as, as cars are coming in, they're swiping their badges. You just go and grab it later, and, uh, and then you have the information uh, to uh, dump, it, uh, you know, dump it elsewhere and, and actually recreate the cards. So we built, we built one of these, um, but we went a step further, um, and we added more power. So it's got a range of, I don't know, a little over two, uh, maybe two and a half feet, something like that, uh, to, uh, to be able to pick those up. So you can actually plant it against the wall, and as people are walking through on a hallway, uh, you can pick uh, pick up uh, badge, uh, you know, badges, that sort of thing. Uh, it has Bluetooth, so you can uh, exfiltrate the uh, badge uh, data out via Bluetooth. Um, so it's just got some uh, it's just got some ideas there to uh, kind of help us. Not necessarily. Again, the whole idea is not be around while the attacks are actually happening uh, or whatever. Try to remain uh, completely covert. And if these kind of out of band measures are will facilitate that, then by all means, that's what we want to bake into these tools. Explain it. Yeah, so let's walk through. Let's walk through some of the uh, the cases that Chris was talking about. Yeah, so this first one is a financial institution. Um, they had a lot of existing security practices in place, all of which are listed up there. Um, it's all pretty standard. I mean, really. So the breach assessments. Um, when we go about kind of selling these to customers, we a lot. Most customers who think they they need a breach assessment aren't ready for one. Um, they have to have mature security practices in place. They have to be doing regular pen tests, you know, things like that. So I think you'll find that uh, all the cases that we have listed here, they all have pretty good existing security processes. Um, you know, things like DDIs, they have decent GPO for, you know, using tier accounts. Endpoint security, which is pretty, pretty standard and pretty useless anyway, but um, yeah. So yeah, and then uh, didn't we uh, on this particular one we saw randomly generated domain admin passwords, right? Yeah. So that was for that was for the tier. Uh, no, this uh, sorry, this is an old. Uh, this isn't for the financial institution. Some of these listed here. Th this is old data. Ignore the HIPAA thing. This was for a different example that we had up here. But oh, yeah, that's good. Excellent. <laughs> Off to a good start. Right on. Um, so yeah, so the uh, um, initial uh, composite chain attack vector. Um, so essentially this organization, uh, <laughs> we, we, we gained access uh, into the organization through, um, through the building, through the actual dwelling, through an egress door, uh, made our way through uh, into, it was kind of this protected uh, huge kind of sky, skyscraper type of building, made our way into uh, the organization. Um, and once we were in there, uh, they had pretty much all of the defenses that you'd expect, uh, turnstiles, uh, badge access to doors, uh, et cetera. But again, that all fails when you actually social engineer your way into the organization. Once you actually social engineer your way into the organization, you're in there, right? You're in there and, and kind of kind of ready to do uh, do the thing that you're, you intended to. So um, along, along, those, uh, along those lines, while we were in uh, performing uh, kind of 
just going going through and kind of evaluating like all of the uh, the different security uh, controls, basically the entire environment. Uh, one of the things we ended up doing was doing an inventory. Um, so we walked uh, we walked through uh, uh, multiple buildings with social engineered or not multiple buildings, multiple floors, so social engineered our way onto uh, those floors, um, and we went through with an inv inventory checklist. And essentially, what we were doing is trying to figure out how we were going to one get some kind of persistent access because while we were going through and performing, I think uh, like the logical uh, primer uh, uh, review, we weren't getting uh, a whole lot of um, we weren't getting a whole lot of leverage uh, by doing that. So as we're going, walking through uh, and performing this inventory and impersonating uh, employees of the organization, we identified that a woman had left a badge uh, unprotected. And this is something that we see, right? So uh, she had left her badge unprotected on the desk. Uh, and in that particular instance, we just took that badge, right? She was away from, away from her desk. She had, wasn't protected on her person. Um, and there was a couple things that we were trying to evaluate there. Uh, the first was we definitely wanted to have a useful badge that we would come in uh, after hours, maybe uh, in the morning, early morning hours, like you know, 2 a.m. or whatever, something like that. Um, uh, the other thing that we wanted to uh, understand is would they decommission a badge if it was reported, uh, and or would they be looking for uh, any kind of event monitoring, alerting uh, that would be associated with a badge that was uh, that was reported missing, right? Um, so later on that evening, uh, just to fast track, we left because we had this. Um, we came back, and at that point, uh, you know, I believe Dan was uh, kind of kind of watching from a, a, a great distance, uh, where I went up to the door and swiped the badge to see if we'd regain entry to see if it would uh, call any of the, uh, you know, invoke any security response, incident response. Um, appropriate protocol would be yes, we decommissioned the badge, but we're we're checking for those badges, and security personnel should show up. Security personnel didn't show up, so at that point we knew we have an, we have an entry, right? So at that point we, we gained uh, access uh, onto uh, into the organization, uh, went through all of the offices. We had access everywhere. Uh, primarily went to one of the floors uh, that we originally obtained the badge from. Uh, as we're reviewing uh, another common mistake uh, surface, uh, so they had. Uh, this particular organization had locked down VDI systems, right? They had locked down basically Citrix vir virtualized desktop, des desktop uh, systems. So it was very, very difficult uh, to uh, potentially break out of those, um, but they were, it's not difficult to break out of Citrix, don't, don't get me wrong, that's, that's very easy. But uh, uh, they had written down uh, a username and a password. Uh, so at that point, we had a working username and password. We checked it while we were on there. But because they were using VDI, if we shelled that box out, as soon as we logged out, uh, logged off the box, then we lost that shell. We didn't have privileged access. It was an unprivileged account. Um, so we kind we kind of uh, rolled in this blended uh, blended attack scenario. So this is a chain composite attack thing. We have the actual domain credentials now. Hold on, but you got to tell how we got the domain cr credentials. So we were in after hours, right? And we yeah. actually found the credentials written on a sticky note in someone's office. Yeah. Did you say that? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's how we found. So um, yeah, so at that point, uh, I think I had to I think I had to catch a plane or something like that. Yeah, the so, next day. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a Friday. Going, it was like Friday afternoon. Yeah, so I was going to the airport. Dan uh, fires up, uh, sends uses those credentials, uh, pops onto their uh, Outlook web web access. Uh, with that, uh, puts a malicious payload, uh, sends it off to the help desk, and immediately calls them up and says, "Hey, I'm having difficulty opening up the uh, you know opening up this document." Um, Apparently convinces the uh, the help desk employee uh, to open the document. It's got a malicious BBS script on the, in the back uh, that's that's uh, that's loaded. That's going to execute and it's going to fire back to our C2 server. Um, after some convincing, he gets them to execute it. We have access outbound, uh, and the help desk employee, like many help desk employees, is uh, is kind of uh, not. He's not necessarily running the VDI system. He's running a standalone a standalone uh, uh, workstation. And it's also running, what, what was it, running as a domain admin? Uh, no, he had, they had tiered accounts, one for non-privileged, um, like everyday use, and then one for more privileged access. Okay. Um, so like the domain admins have like a regular, you know, AD account plus one just for like their privileged activities. The problem that we see more often than not is that it's pretty convenient to just reuse the same password for both accounts. Yep. So, and that's what happened. Okay, so now we have uh, we have shell on the administrator's box. So that's our first chain, 
right? That's that's kind of our initial chain buffer. So now we're going to chain we're chaining the chain composite attack. All right. So now we need to because we have access to that box and now we have some level of uh, well because we have some level of access we need to establish persistence. So we um, at that point do you want to talk about like how you how you got the um, yeah, so after we got domain admin access, um, uh, so, I mean, we just accessed a domain controller, and uh, interestingly, their domain controllers and servers were allowed to talk outbound, which, you know, there's really no reason that your server should need to talk out over the internet. Um, so what we did is we, we established, um, we basically used Windows schedule tasks and just set up, um, like, a, basically a, an interpreter reverse shell to run, what was it, like, eight times a day across three different domain controllers, yeah, something yeah. like that. So we just kept getting shells in, you know? Yeah. Um, Which is an awful thing to do, don't do that. Um, but at, the, <laughs> at that same time, it does like test to see if they're looking for uh, anything that's actually egress and leaving, leaving the network. Typically, um, on servers, uh, you would schedule tasks much, much less. You know, you might schedule a task every, every few days, something to that effect. If it's a workstation, much more. Um, you wanna make sure that, uh, you know, workstation traffic is a lot more frequent, especially when making outbound uh, outbound connections, you know, elsewhere. Um, so they're not necessarily looking at worksta work workstation outbound uh, egress traffic as much as they would be on a server. Um, so yeah, at that point we have persistence, uh, and that's why we say patience is a virtue because we're just going to sit on these. Um, uh, the next the next uh, uh, slide is basically chaining the chain of the chained composite attack. So this is basically taking our initial point. Uh, to establishing our persistence outbound through a critical system, uh, and now we're going to take it to uh, take it to kind of the final stage, uh, where we need to identify uh, individuals that are critical. We need to underst uh, understand uh, folks that are maybe associated with physical uh, uh, building physical security. Uh, we need to uh, understand folks uh, that uh, have access to you know in this particular instance, it's it's a financial organization, right? We need to understand how do they move, how do they do ACH transactions, et cetera, out of, out of the organization. So we need to figure out those critical, those critical individuals. We don't necessarily care about all of the, the ancillary risk associated with the other things uh, that are in the environment. We only care about those specific items. So we patch up the network share login script, uh, and that way, when they log in, they're using a, a, a mounted a, a login script. So when they log in, it, it drops uh, a flat file uh, and, it's, and it gives the actual physical machine. We have access to the network share, so we can pick up the actual physical machine. We know their, uh, we know their username, their account name. Now we can redirect all of our activity, our attention towards those, those critical systems, right? Those systems that, you know, if we need uh, further building access, say for instance, it's an entire campus environment, but we only have access to one building. Now we can target those, uh, those particular folks that do badge procurement, um, that sort of thing. Um, so we do that. Uh, we locate building facilities. Uh, we locate uh, uh, the user systems of great importance, pretty much. Uh, and now at this point, if we've identified all of those, we've obtained uh, really people that know about ACH transfers. We know people that have uh, this tribal knowledge within the organization that you know we only have a few days, maybe a few weeks, maybe a month, et cetera, to, to understand. So we just kind of pause at that point. We stay quiet, we go dormant, and we research absolutely everything that we can. And that's that's kind of a critical. Um, that takes the longest part of the engagement. Yeah, that's it's not usually just trying to find the needle in the haystack. Yeah, that's not sexy, but I mean that is like fundamentally what uh, I think overall assessing is. It's basically just researching, reviewing, um, and understanding kind of kind of your target, understand what you're going after, right? And in this particular instance, what we're going after is an infrastructure. We want to know. Uh, how those systems interact. We want to know how we can exfiltrate money uh, out of the organization. So with that, uh, we identify um, the mainframes that uh, uh, the mainframes that uh, uh, basically all the uh, FDIC transactions go through, uh, etc. Uh, we uh, identify the uh, software that interacts with those mainframes, uh, and in order not to uh, uh, really truly uh, exfiltrate that data. That's, that's the point where we, we, we pause, we stop, and we get a hold of the, uh, the project sponsor and we say, hey, we're on your mainframe, we have access to your, to your stuff, right? Uh, set up a shell account for us. So that's what they do, they set up a shell account, uh, they fund that shell account, uh, and we demonstrate at that point uh, that we can move money uh, outside of their organization, and that's good enough. That's enough to show impact. Um, 
yeah, so that's that's kind of at that point that that's where that uh, entire how long did this last? About two months, yeah. something like that. So it's about two months worth of work uh, to uh, to perform this this sort of attack. But it demonstrates that your typical penetration test or typical traditional test isn't going to necessarily identify that sequence of, of events that's going to lead up to such a great impact, right? That's the stuff that's actually going to kill a business. You know, that you, you, you disclose your account, your financial data, you, uh, you bleed money uh, out of your organization and you don't detect that, that's, that's, you know, that's detrimental to, to an organization. So at that point, uh, I think really, you know, we, um, we kind of talked to, uh, talk to the project sponsor and you know, overall, uh, the outcome is that we want to protect, we want to help the organization protect those critical assets, those critical processes, uh, and prevent that from happening. All the, all, all the rest of the ancillary vulnerabilities, the, the other things that we don't necessarily, uh, we don't necessarily concern ourselves during a breach assessment or a breach simulation uh, that maybe occurred during a penetration test, those are kind of off to the wayside because those might just be another point of entry uh, to get to the same destination that we got to. So we want to uh, protect, we want to help the client protect uh, that most critical process, most critical uh, 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 piece of data. Um, lessons learned on that was that uh, incident response was inadequate. Um, they did detect uh, our presence on the network at one point. Um, we, uh, this was when we were physically on site yep. and we plugged a laptop into their network. This was after we sold the badge went back on site at like 2 a.m., plugged a, a laptop in, ran a few port scans to see what, you know, what was there or whatever. They detected the laptop. You know, it was an unauthorized device on their network. They dispatched somebody, but they dispatched somebody from the, the information security team who lived 45 minutes away. So, you know, why, why would they dispatch someone who lives 45 minutes away? Why would they dispatch an InfoSec person when it probably should be someone trained to deal with a hostile, you know, individual, yep. you know, depending on who it is. So uh, things like that, you know, your, your pen test isn't going to find that. I mean, yep. right? That's that's a process thing. Yep. Uh, ineffective egress controls. Why are your critical servers talking outbound? Uh, you have domain controllers. You got databases. Why are they allowed to talk outbound? There's no reason for that. So, uh, yeah, that was that was interesting. Um, uh, password reuse between tiered accounts. Uh, there was no uh, identity and access management. There was no, uh, you know, there really wasn't no pr uh, protection or prevention uh, from from someone establishing a lower, uh, you know, lower privileged privileged account to a higher, you know, higher privileged account and reuse that password. Um, single factor off uh, on both the uh, Outlook web access and uh, on uh, bank applications. Um, again, these, uh, you know, when when. One of the first things that we do is we try to compromise uh, the actual uh, email systems, right? Because email systems are critical intelligence. It's critical surveillance on what we're going through. Uh, you know, as we're kind of moving throughout the entire attack sequence, we want to understand what they've detected. Uh, we want to understand if they've dispatched something to like mitigate our attack whatsoever to uh, maybe block us, to notify, whatever. We don't care. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll hack the uh, internet or the uh, instant messaging systems. We'll hack the uh, the email. If you protect it with a simple uh, username and password, uh, we're going to get the password. We're going to we're going to basically just squat on those systems and intercept traffic. We're going to identify your again. That's a, the real reason why we uh, target building physical security because we want to understand that. It's the reason why we target infosec folks because we under, understand what they're doing. It's the reason why we uh, target uh, information technology groups because we understand that as well as all the rest of the uh, the folks that have the that again that uh, intrinsic knowledge. Um, Guard stations, physical badge, unsecured. Uh, so these guys leave at a certain time of night, and they just leave it all. You've heard of uh, clean dust policy. Uh, some of these guys don't believe in that, so they just leave everything, just kind of, kind of laying out. Or they'll take all the badges and they'll throw them in a drawer, uh, and they won't, they won't lock them, right? They'll just leave them, or they'll just, uh, uh, they'll put them in some kind of minimal security uh, uh, enclosure, right? That we can get to uh, quite easily, right? And it's just kind of out there in the open. Yeah. What he didn't say is we also stole what twenty vendor badges straight out of the security guard desk yeah. one night. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and then you know we have the inadequate social engineering challenge, and we have uh, weak password policy. So these are uh, uh, the, the inadequate social engineering challenge thing. That's uh, it's kind of hard to protect against, right? We, we the, there's a hard it's it's difficult to mitigate that. But the weak password policy, if you got weak passwords, uh, that's that's kind of first defense, right? You you need to. 
employ something that's complex and preferably some kind of multi-factor authentication. Um, we're running out of time, so yeah, let's fast do track. Do we have 20 minutes? Do we? How much time we got? 20 minutes. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah let's just do three. Okay. Do you want to roll through that? Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll jump into this case. So, similar along the same lines, we'll just kind of run through the whole uh, attack scenario. So, this was a, uh, a large insurance company. Um, Again, they had uh, very good existing security policies, including you know authenticated outbound proxy, network segmentation. Um, most of this is pretty standard, but they actually had really good egress controls where like none of their servers were allowed to talk outbound, so they were actually doing that right. Um, and they also had uh, very good physical security. Um, and we'll get into some of this, but. Um, they had turnstiles pretty much at every point, um, egress point in, in the building, um, even getting up in and um, out of elevators. I mean, every floor had turnstiles, so if you didn't have a badge, um, then you probably weren't going to be able to uh, tailgate in or anything like that. Um, let's see. So we kind of knew about their physical security before we, we set foot on site. Um, so while we were doing some of the, the, the remote testing, you know, the question kind of loomed as we were kind of planning our on-site portion of it. Um, you know, how are we actually gonna get in physically? Um, you know, when we do these engagements, there's almost always an on-site and a remote component, right? And so to fully test an organization, we feel like we have to have like a legitimate attack vector in both. So, you know, that was kind of the question. Well, when we go on site, are we even gonna be able to do anything? So we weren't sure. Um, so we actually attempted three different spear phishing campaigns uh, initially. So um, it netted us two sets of, do of, of uh, domain creds, um, but they detected us fairly quickly. Um, with the domain creds, we got access to uh, Citrix environment externally that was using single factor auth. Um, but they detected it quickly, they killed our sessions, and they actually forced the people to change the passwords. But what this actually told us is it, it disclosed their password policy, and it was weak. It was like you know six characters, something like that. So um, what we were able to do is kind of take that idea and uh, tune a password guessing attack against one of their authentication portals um, based on like a you know a six character password policy. And so what this you know this was we use you know a common um, you know a common pattern is to use like uh, you know the month followed by the year. So at this, in this case, it was like Jan 2015, I think we chose. And we just ran it across a number of different uh, uh, users. It, it also disclosed their, their user account naming system. So they didn't use like first initial last name, they used like a predictable type, well, semi-predictable, um, you know. Uh, type of alphanumeric. Template, yeah. yeah. It was kind of alphanumeric, it was incremental, you know. So you could kind of iterate through them and try to guess. So. Um, you know, we just ran a password get, uh, guessing campaign using that password and it, it, it got us, I don't know, six, ten different uh, hits. Yep. So we were back in, and this time, um, since we didn't have to do a spear fish attack, uh, they didn't detect us. So we had access to Citrix, we broke out of Citrix, um, and uh, you know, from there we, we noted that uh, one of the credentials that we had pulled um, one of the groups that it belonged to in Active Directory, it was listed as like the machine name underscore admin was the group. So we're like, hey, this guy's an admin on that box. So we uh, authenticate as that user to that box. And sure enough, he was a local admin. So, you know, we get system, we dump the hashes us using Mimikatz, if you guys have used that. Um, so we dump the creds and on there was domain admin. So just like that, we had a domain admin. Um, uh, let's see, yeah, so next slide. Um, okay, but like I said, they had really good um, egress controls, so we had to pretty much tunnel all of our traffic through the Citrix box. Um, expanding the network presence was a little bit challenging for that reason, so we couldn't really bounce around like we normally could because we couldn't establish remote, uh, the, you know, reverse connections. Um, but what we were able to do is, you know, through that access, um, we, we were able to actually browse network shares as domain admin. Um, we bounced around and expanded our presence, pulled other domain domain admin passwords and things like that, just so we had you know a, a better uh, foothold on the network. Um, and we did things like from network shares, and this is pretty common. You know, we just looked at an HR payroll network share, and we we pulled files that had all their employees, you know, pay information, uh, social security numbers, things like that. Uh, pulled. Uh, customer details, um, 
we didn't really know what most of it meant, quite honestly, because it was insurance and you know, it's insurance. I don't know what insurance is. Um, but uh, you know, it looked like it was it was sensitive in nature. Um, and so most importantly, um, we spent a good deal of our time actually focusing on recon. So we started targeting um, the ac actual uh, facilities folks. Um, from the network shares, we identified the name of their badge provisioning software, um, as well as their security camera software. Um, we got access to their security cameras remotely. So this is how we knew about their, their physical security presence before we set foot on site. So we're looking at cameras in their lobby and we're noting all the turnstiles everywhere. We noted that they had a 24 hour guard presence, right? So we weren't gonna get in after hours and walk right past the guard desk. There was nobody there but the guard. Like we weren't gonna sneak by it. So that's, that's how we kind of wondered. So we spent a good deal of time actually focusing specifically on weaknesses or, or uh, you know, how we could, we could actually provision our own badge. So one, one of the big things that we ended up doing was, you know, I talked about uh, gaining access to uh, webmail. Right? Once we identified that there was a physical security uh, person uh, and we understood which system that, uh, that he lived on, um, also gained access to the webmail and then spent a good amount of time rifling through and just reading absolutely everything, doing targeted uh, searches. So we knew that, uh, uh, we knew that they did ba uh, badge provisioning, but we wanted to understand specifically what that meant. Um, so we got the reader types, we got the badge types, we got the provisioning details for the badge, um, we knew that they had a certain facility ID code associated with the badge. Um, we knew that they paid extra money to HID uh, to, uh, to get uh, uh, encryption keys. Um, we, we had a wealth of knowledge uh, that we can leverage uh, kind of going into all of this. And, and we didn't actually have the equipment to, to create our own badge for the specific type they were using. Yeah. So we were kind of screwed in that nature. So we're, we're kind of like, well, well, you know, dang, we can't create our own. So, you know, what's the alternative? So. <laughs> Uh, we actually we gained access to the badging software remotely before we set foot on site as as like their facilities uh, manager. Uh, the problem is once we actually got on site. So our plan was, you know, we have access to this badging software. What we'll do is we'll take an existing card that we had that was kind of the same type. We'll go scan it or whatever and just capture it in the system. We can go look at the logs in the software and then basically add it as an authorized card. That was kind of kind of our our level of thinking. Um, there were some limitations to that where we wouldn't be able to get access to all the floors that we wanted to because you know you could only add a certain number of card types per floor. So uh, we didn't know if that was the route we necessarily wanted to go. Um, so we had access, we went on site and we're like, all right, well at least we have kind of a foothold. We have an idea of something that we can do. The problem is when we got on site, we no longer had access to this, this user's account, this, the, the facilities manager. He changed his password. There were a couple of coincidental things that we, we could no longer get his password through the same means that, that we had. So we went to the domain controller and we uh, performed a shadow copy of the ntds.dit file, tried to extract it. Problem is extracting it while tunneling everything through the Citrix server was incredibly slow. Um, it failed multiple times. So, I mean, we were kind of, you know, out of luck um, doing that remotely. Now, we found a different weakness that normally you wouldn't think is necessarily a big deal, but their wireless signal bleed was incredible. I mean, I'm, we're talking like two blocks away from the facility, you had full wireless strength to their, their corporate network. So we went and sat at a Starbucks one night and downloaded the file in 10 minutes time, you know? Like as Starbucks was closing, we downloaded the file, then you know we, uh, we used the NTDS.dit file cracked the passwords, got the guy's password back, got access back to the badging software. Um, so again, you know, we, we exploited like the wireless signal bleed, something you wouldn't normally consider as a big deal uh, to, to kind of gain access. Um, also while we were doing info, um, uh, while we were digging around their network shares and, and their email, we actually found documents about um, their processes for issuing badges to employees who had like left them at home. And the, the interesting thing is, okay, so they required like three pieces of information. So, uh, you know, an employee shows up to work, like, yeah, I left my badge at home, issue me a temporary badge. So they required the employee's name, um, their network ID, um, and also it was their, uh, they, yeah, they validated a picture in the software uh, that we had access to. They validated that picture against the person standing in front of them. 
And so, yeah, you know where I'm going with this. So what we did, two o'clock in the morning, a picture of him is fantastic. He looks like hell. I was, um, I was yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we, just, we just got back from like a whiskey dinner or something. Yeah. I I think we were out drinking before that, but so it was like two o'clock in the morning. We thought it was a good idea to take this picture. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know, you, you look professional. It's like your first day of work there. Yeah. Um, so we take this picture, and uh, we actually figured out where they store all all the employee photos. And we uh, just randomly picked out an employee, and we're like, all right, you're going to be this guy for the day. We put his his photo in there, um, validated that it was his picture when he pulled up. And uh, we're like, okay, um, yeah, so you're just gonna walk in, tell the guard you're this guy, and um, you know, see if they'll issue you a temporary badge. Once he gets a temporary working badge, I mean, it's game over. We have access to the software, and we can grant it God rights to the entire building and stuff, right? Um, so just you know, to, to make it more fun, I sat at the Starbucks next door because of the wireless signal boom. Oh, oh yeah, so part of the process let's, let's, when the issue. Well, let's, let's talk about like, the reason why we had to get the badge real quick. So the badge, uh, the facility code on the badge, uh, it was proprietary. We mm -hmm. couldn't recreate the actual I-class badges that yeah. they were using. Uh, and the actual readers that they were using would only allow, and because it was like a multi-tenant building, they could provision up to eight separate uh, or eight individual facility ID codes. And then after that, you couldn't provision anything else. So you actually had to have like one of their valid badges or clone a valid badge with a valid uh, uh, facility code. Now, because they were all maxed out, if we dropped one of the facility codes associated with an individual reader, that means that we're performing a denial of service essentially on the tenant. No one's going to be able to get into uh, into the building via that. So that's definitely going to set off uh, uh, alarms. Yeah. So that's the reason why we needed an actual badge. We needed mm -hmm. an actual I class uh, badge with a facility code. And, and also, we noted from the, the documents that we were looking at for provisioning that uh, part of the process is when, when an employee's issued a temporary badge, they disable the employee's previous badge, right? And so his badge won't work until he returns the temporary badge, then they re-enable it, right? It's just so that he only has one working badge at any given time. And they also add a note in there saying that this employee was issued this temporary badge, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, he walks in into, uh, up to the guard and, and tells him that you know, he left his, his badge at home. And we made sure that we did this first thing in the morning before the employee got, got in. You know, we didn't want to raise any alarms or whatever that this employee's in the building trying to swipe and he just can't get anywhere you know, because it's temporarily disabled. So first thing in the morning, 7.30 or whatever, he walks in, goes and uh, explains to the guard that he left his badge at home. Sure enough, you know, he gives he gives the fake name and the uh, the the LAN ID account um, um, that we knew, and then they validate the picture uh, again, the picture that he looks like hell in. Yeah. So if yeah, I may. yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so before, uh, so this is kind of the social engineering aspect of it, right? Uh, so when I went, when we took the picture, I looked like hell. I've got a full beard. Right. Uh, I've got like two uh, a.m. bags under your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Looks like I've showered in like two days. Yeah. So um, so then. Uh, when I walk in, I'm you know dressed in uh, you know really nice business attire, right? I'm clean shaven. It looks like it gives the impression that a lot of time has elapsed, right? So that was back when you know back when I first started back when you years, were a bum. yeah, back when I was a bum and I got my first job <laughs> out of wherever. Um, and now at this point, uh, you know, I'm I'm an actual respectable uh, person working in an insurance uh, company, so it was it was very uh, it was very uh, believable. Mm -hmm. So he, he gets issued a temporary badge, just it worked out flawlessly, right? So he's in there for all of a minute, gets the temporary working badge, you know, walks out of the building. He, he comes over to Starbucks before I even have a chance to like open up my, my laptop. I'm like, you're, you're back already? He's like, yeah, they, they, they got me the badge. So I'm working frantically, you know, trying to re-enable this other guy's badge before he gets in. So uh, I get the badge re-enabled and then he's like, all right, well, I'm gonna go test it out. So. I re-enable the other guy's badge, you know, remove all the history, the, the note that was added in there. So there's really no record um, that the second badge was actually issued to this guy. You know, and he just walks into the building and, you know, authenticates to the turnstile, hops on the elevator and goes up to the point of contacts, you know, floor and walks around. So, yep. you know, at that point it was a, a weakness in, in their process, you know, like how do you validate an employee who left his wallet at home? You know, he can't show you government ID because he left his wallet at home. Well, they need to think of a different, you know, uh, validation means. You know, somebody has to look at you, come down and escort you, or something yep. like that. So, yep. and the moral of the story is it's that yeah, easy. It's just that easy. <laughs> so um, oh yeah. So this is um, yeah. 
just kind of the review, you know, some of the, the, the findings that, that we have. Um, we're running out of time, so we won't go over these, but, you know, we talked about these, um, and some of these are repeats from the other scenario we talked about. So um, you'll see common threads are really single factor off. We see that it's, it's one of the most damning um, issues, so that kind of leads to the next slide, I think. Yeah. We kind of compiled a list of, you know, what are like the most, most serious flaws that we actually see? And uh, you know, if you could fix one thing in your organization, if you could dedicate you know money to, to like one thing, well, we would probably, I would probably push for two-factor authentication, yep. like everywhere. I mean, realistically, that's not gonna happen, but you know what I'm saying. Um, uh, improper egress controls on servers outbound. Those two things alone, I think, would make our jobs a hell of a lot harder. And uh, you know, in spending money, um, it. it a lot of times for organizations, I mean, you don't have unlimited amounts of money, right? So you just try to spend enough money that you can delay an attacker long enough that you can detect him, right? And that's kind of the goal. That's the re that, that should be a realistic goal. Nah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so reasons for a lot of these vulnerabilities, we'll just shoot through these real quick. Uh, mergers and acquisitions, people, uh, people lose track of their, um, what they truly have, uh, what they, bless you, what they truly have in their environment. Um, so uh, through, through merger and acquisition, uh, they attain a whole lot of different assets, different resources, and they don't have a good inventory, right? So it, it introduces vulnerabilities. Uh, ineffective asset management, they just don't know what they don't know. So they don't perform a, a, an asset management or an asset inventory uh, throughout the entire uh, organization. Uh, they, have, uh, they have outliers. They you know, don't know that they have you know, servers that are controlling a sprinkler system elsewhere that's actually still connected to the network. Okay, it's just introduced a vulnerability. Um, employee turnover, uh, that, can, uh, that can definitely happen. Uh, you don't maintain that continuity. Uh, when you have a dedicated employee and that employee leaves and you have turnover, you kind of lose that tribal knowledge that that employee once, once uh, had, right? Um, disparate uh, change management processes. Uh, so you might have good change management in your Windows systems, but you don't have good change management on your, uh, your Nix environment. Um, you don't have good change management uh, on your network elements, your switches, your routers, uh, your DLP devices. Well, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just uh, you have all of these, these kind of uh, uh, ancillary devices out there. Um, what Dan was just talking about, um, inadequate budget. So you just don't have the budget. You might not have the... Uh, uh, the C-level uh, support, and you might not have the support from the board of directors to uh, allocate funds associated with uh, upgrading security. Um, that's a that's another big thing is just no executive support. You can't get anything done if your team doesn't support you. I mean, so if you're trying to make big purchase, trying to try and mitigate risk, and you don't have uh, uh, the necessary means, you're kind of shit on luck. Uh, so, uh, lack of trained, skilled InfoSec pros. Uh, we know that is uh, definitely a problem in the industry. Um, can't get enough skilled, uh, skilled resources uh, that not only are skilled, can talk technical, but can also bridge that gap and understand, have adequate business acumen um, to be able to talk to uh, numerous, uh, numerous target audiences. Um, and if it's not a priority, that's going to be a problem. So I just hope that you lawyer, lawyer up and get lots of uh, errors and omissions insurance because that uh, that's going to be a problem later on down the road. Um, and I think one of the big things uh, that uh, and this is kind of fun to uh, evangelize, uh, really kind of what a security vendor uh, does in that entire relationship, uh, is to use it as a vehicle to uh, to help help obtain your agenda. Right. So if you need more funds, leverage your security vendor uh, uh, to to kind of direct their attention towards those things uh, that are critical, that impact the organization. Help them help you build a case so you can go back and you can get the necessary. Yeah, help. a lot of times we actually get requests, I mean, the issues that maybe we wouldn't call out specifically or make that big of a deal. The customers will ask us, well, can you highlight that? You know, we've been pushing for funding for that. Can you highlight it? Yep, yeah, you know, we have no problem doing that. Yep. If it helps, you know. Most bang for the buck. Yeah. Yep. That's effective. Yep. <laughs> Can't hide it. And this is kind of just reiterating that, uh, yeah. I think. So. Yeah. Some of the the, uh, the most critical things that you could probably put in your environment that like yeah. said, would make our jobs. Multi-factor authentication, hard. authenticated outbound proxies, egress controls. Um, this is identifying your critical servers that uh, shouldn't be talking outbound. Securing your BIOS. Uh, 
not to prevent devices uh, from connecting to uh, LAN and Wi-Fi. Uh, that would prevent us from actually gaining uh, passwords and you know, going to Starbucks and authenticating and being able to compromise your network. Uh, monitoring, alerting, and auditing of batch provisioning, that's another big thing, obviously, because then at that point, uh, when we deactivate an employee's badge, we reactivate, we reprovision, we change privilege levels associated with the badge, all of those sorts of things should trigger events, uh, and those should be investigated. And then critical fi file integrity checking for really some of your most important um, your most important uh, resources on, uh, say, for instance, servers and things like that. So if you know that uh, you've got uh, transaction software uh, that uh, maybe moved money uh, into uh, maybe another batch process or something like that, you definitely want to uh, uh, implement integrity monitoring because if someone comes in there and they change it, changes the hash, the, the overall signature of that file, you want to be able to flag on something like that, right? Um, and All right, we're going to have questions. We're yeah. almost out of time. I don't know if we have. Yep. Go so, and, and that's that's it. That's Q and A. Open it up for Q and A. Okay. Any questions? <coughs> Comments? Yeah. So when you uh, you said the uh, wireless security is like pretty modern. Where is that wireless uh, protected, or uh, like was it was there any password for the wireless? Yeah, they were using Peep. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was Peep. It was a. Uh, it was Peep, but we had domain creds. Yeah. I mean, at that point, so. They, they just weren't doing any kind of like client cert yep. validation, right? Okay. Anyone else? Sweet. All right. Cool. Well, thanks, thanks guys. guys.